Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the Greeks, according to their own mythology, struggled to overthrow the Trojans of Troy. In a brilliant move of deception, they present a statue. You're familiar with this statue known as the Trojan Horse. They present it to the people of Troy as a bit of a peace offering, or how, that's how it's received. But inside this peace offering were some Greek soldiers who after the gift of peace was ushered into the, the community of Troy with their impenetrable walls and warriors guarding them, they waited and they waited and they waited until all in Troy was quiet and everybody was asleep. And then these soldiers worked their way out of this peace offering, went to the, the gates, opened the gates and let their army march in thus overthrowing Troy. Troy went to sleep that night, assuming peace had been reached and woke up to a slaughter because they didn't account for the brilliance and military prowess of their opponent. In our passage today, Revelation chapter 13, which was just read, we see Satan, the great serpent, the dragon, use a similar approach to continue to lead the world astray and now full-on attack God's people. Now, he doesn't present a statue of a horse by any means, but he uses lies and deceptions and false claims and then ultimately violence to try to overthrow God and destroy his people and set up for himself a throne and a kingdom. Unlike the Greeks, Satan ultimately fails, but he's still trying. And so we need to heed the warnings that come out of a passage like this, or we are bound to be like the Trojans, to welcome an enemy in thinking all is well, only to wake up to a spiritual slaughter. We must be alert, we must be wise, and we must have patient endurance and faith. So let's turn our attention to Revelation chapter 13. We begin in verse one, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. The dragon, as we learned last week from chapter 12, verse nine, is in fact point blankly Satan, the great serpent. Satan is standing on the beach, beach and out of the water comes a beast. This would ruin family vacation for sure, all right? The beast comes out of the sea like a leviathan and it had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and each head had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. Now this beast is unlike anything John had ever seen before. Visually, this, this thing is a predator. It is scary. It is intimidating. It is going to destroy anything in its path. And he knows this because in Daniel chapter 7, we see Daniel with a similar vision, except there are four beasts in Daniel's vision exemplifying these characteristics. And in Daniel's vision, this is a very like socio-political kind of vision. And then here in John's vision, we see one beast with all of these things. I would argue this is signifying that this beast represents the best that Satan can throw at God and his people. He's pulled out all of the stops. This is the culmination of Satan's effort to win, to set up his throne. He doesn't succeed, but we technically don't know that yet. All right, the 10 horns and the seven heads, there are many books and theories written on what these things represent, but I think the thing that we need to focus on most is the description of the dragon in chapter 12. See, Satan has the same description with the seven heads and the 10 horns and, and all of this kind of stuff. And then this beast comes out of the sea in the image of Satan. And Satan then gives this beast his power. There's a mocking and a mimicking of God at play here. Right? Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is exalted to the throne of God in heaven. 
Right? This is what Satan is doing in an attempt to win. He's trying to be God. He's trying to do what God has done. I think it's vital that we see first and foremost in the description of the beast that it is actually the beast standing in the image of Satan more importantly than what are the ten horns and the seven heads. Now again, if we go back to Daniel 7, the ten horns echo uh, what Daniel sees in his vision regarding the fourth beast in chapter 7. The ten horns represent ten kings that rise out of the fourth kingdom. John would have undoubtedly had Daniel's vision in mind as he's seeing his own vision. There would have been a clear understanding in John's mind that this represents a significant multiplied political power. Not a local thing, but a global thing. John would have thought ultimately at that time of Rome and its evil rulers. Now, as an aside, because this dabbles into the realm of politics and we get to flirt with religion and politics today, so that's going to go well. Um, throughout church history, people have thought that they were living in the literal last days. Like we, I'm going to see Jesus return before I die. And maybe we will, but maybe we won't. But from the time of the Old Testament, even the Old Te or New Testament, even New Testament writers talk about living in the last days and awaiting and looking forward to seeing Christ return. Right? This is not something new. Throughout history, people have thought that their government or other governments were evil or the beast. People have pointed the finger at, pe at, at others who disagree with them as the Antichrist. Right? Maybe the Pope being the most common. But my point is simply this. When we come into passages like Revelation, instead, or Revelation 13, instead of getting bogged down in the details, what if instead we looked for what God is doing and what God is warning us about? Right? There are warnings that come with this vision that we must pay attention to. And we're gonna get to those towards the end, but first let's continue looking at the craziness that's going to unfold. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Again, this is Satan mimicking and mocking God, giving power to the beast as the father gives to the son in heaven. And in a moment, when we get to the second beast, we're going to see a bit of a, 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 a trinity vibe to what Satan is doing, mocking God and killing God's people in the process. Now, verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. Now again, books upon books, what's the fatal wound? Who does this? Um, I, I, I believe, my, my understanding of this, is that this fatal wound was the result of Christ going to the cross and rising again. The fatal wound is the blow that is dealt when the true God, the Son of God, lays down his power, takes on our sin, is crucified on a cross, and rises again. Right? That deals the death blow to sin and to Satan and to death. But Satan has some power and ability and is healed. And this beast has the mark of this blow and is healed. And because of this healing, there is this sense of, or appearance of victory. Right? Like th this guy might win. He's overcome a lot in his life and people are fooled. Look at the last part of verse three. The whole world is fooled, is filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Now, people are so into what the beast is doing and the power that it's showing and, and the words that it is saying and the way that it's easing their desires and what they want and what they think is right, that they don't even realize that the worship that they give to the beast echoes the worship that the Israelites gave to God in Exodus chapter 15. Verses 11 and 12 of Exodus 15 says, who among the gods is like you? Lord, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemy. 
that the people worship the dragon who is like the beast who can wage war against it. And the people of Israel are like, God, you are so good and so majestic and so powerful that when somebody stands against you, you raise your right hand and your creation does the work for you. The earth destroys your enemies, right? Like who can actually stand before God? No one. But the people have been deceived and are offering the worship meant for the one true God to a false God. They bow themselves to an inferior God, essentially damning themselves in their pride. But the dragon and the beast aren't actually here for the world. They want the worship, they crave the worship, they accept the worship of the world, but actually what they're here to do is seen beginning in verse five. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise authority for 42 months. Now, quick pause, the 42 months might be literal, might be figurative, but what we see happening yet again in the book of Revelation is God allowing something to happen. God on his throne allows Satan to have authority on this earth for a short while. And God limits that and God allows that. And during that time, verse six, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Again, global. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast and all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Now, first we see Satan and the beast blaspheming, slandering. They are telling lies. They are saying things over and over again with such uh, wordsmithing that people believe them. It sounds good. It sounds right. It would be foolish to argue against the wisdom that they are saying. Right? Point one, de deception happens. Right? Satan will come not as a demander of worship at first, but as a deceiver. Right? Two, in, the, in six, seven, and eight, um, Christ or Christians are not the inhabitants of the earth. Unbelievers are. Those are who are led astray. Those who have rejected Christ are the inhabitants of the earth. Those are the ones being led astray. Now, I believe that this, this isn't just the atheists in, on, on the earth at this time. What we see happening with those led astray are those who are not actually walking with the Lord, who might claim to be a Christian, but otherwise live a life of unbelief see this wonderful thing that the beast is doing and say, ooh, shiny, I want this. And they go astray. They follow the lesser God thinking that it is the better God. Next, Christ was the plan from day one. Christ was the plan from day one because God who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and I, sit outside of time. God sits outside of his creation. He's not bound to his creation. God created time when he made the sun and the moon to govern the day and the night. If God sits outside of time, he can look and he knows what is going to happen. And that seems crazy knowing what we know and experiencing what we experience, except there's this crazy cool reality that God knew this and he still wanted us enough to deal with it. He wanted us enough to know that in creating us, he was ultimately going to send his son to live and die and rise again in our place. Christ was the plan from day one. God is on his throne, not the false trinity that we're about to see, not the dragon or its beasts, God. God is on his throne here. God is on his throne around the world. God rules. God is sovereign. And we have to cling to this reality and this hope because of what we are about to see. Think of the social and political powers that influence and deceive people away. They're not generally demanding that you stop following Christ, but instead they present something that is reasonable. Think about the cultural mantra of, in this house, love is love. 
why would anybody say love is not love? Right? This seems appealing. It seems nice. It seems inclusive. It seems welcoming until you read your Bible and you realize that the essence of love is God. God is love. Love defined by God has limits and restrictions. Right? Love is not love apart from God. Love is love as the world understands it is actually just emotionally and lustfully driven. But it sounds good, right? There's this little lie that we don't want to deal with. And it sounds good. And we don't want to deal with the tension of having hard conversations. And so it's, yeah, that sounds good. We'll go with that. Right? This is the deceiver at work in a small way. John recognizes that all of this stuff is going to happen. He's listing this stuff out. And then verse nine, he says, whoever has ears, let him hear. And if anyone's to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone's going to be killed with the sword, the, to the, with the sword, they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And God is so on his throne that what he has planned for the world and for your life is going to happen. That can either be scary or incredibly encouraging. And believe the reason that John points us there before we get to the second beast is to challenge us as believers, as Christians, to not be comfortable. Right? To be prepared for a world in which there will be a beast that reigns. Many will be imprisoned and even killed because they profess Jesus Christ as Lord. And it, it's happening in pockets around the world today. But as Revelation comes to a point, right, we, we see little foreshadows or little tastes of the persecution that Revelation has talked about in pockets, right, in, in micro areas throughout the world, maybe even in our own lives at times. But what Revelation is getting at is essentially this, this summit or this peak where it becomes a global experience, which means we need to take our eyes off of our own country only, right? To, to have a more global understanding as we think about how this stuff unfolds and when it unfolds and all that kind of stuff. Believers must be prepared for a world in which Satan seems to be winning. Now, the first beast and its blasphemies and false teaching and the war against Christians is at work, and then we're introduced to a second beast. The first one comes out of the sea like a Leviathan kind of beast. The second is from the land as if behemoth. These are mythical monsters that people would have been familiar with in their day and maybe even been afraid to go into the woods because of. And if John understood the first beast because of Daniel to be aimed at the socio-political elements of his day, like Rome and emperor worship, then the second beast would be the priesthood that propagated worship of the emperor. Like, hey, this emperor is doing well. He wants what's good for you. You should, you should follow him. You should trust him. You should trust him with your life. We see the second beast in chapter, or verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. This is where we begin to see with clarity the deception in which Satan uses. Horns like a lamb might be mocking Jesus being the sacrificial lamb, but certainly in appearance, a lamb is harmless, almost like an infant. You look at this lamb or, or a baby and, and there's not a threat to you. If anything, you want to care for it. You want to make sure that that lamb gets to its mom and gets fed and is, is well off. You know that you can care for it. You know that you can trust it. It seems non-threatening. Then he speaks like a dragon, like the serpent dragon that we met in chapter 12. Maybe this is a booming, fiery voice, but unlikely, because throughout Scripture, Satan is much more uh, behind the scenes. Right? Think of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, Satan enters the garden as a serpent, goes to Eve, and he doesn't say, eat this fruit. You must eat this fruit. 
he says, does God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? Right? Introducing doubt, engaging in a conversation with Eve that ultimately causes Eve to entertain the doubt, to ask the questions, and to then take and eat. And in taking and eating, she realizes in that moment that, wow, this is a beautiful piece of fruit, and man, does it taste good. Maybe, just maybe, this, this snake knew better for me than what God said. It's a subtle, slippery slope kind of deception. Right? This is the way the dragon speaks. Not a demanding yet that you bow and worship him, but wordsmithing and backdoor deals, all sorts of trickery, to arrive at a place where people believe that what the beast is doing is right. The second beast exercised all authority of the first beast on its behalf. So the dragon gives authority to the first beast, and now the first beast gives it to the second beast to act on its behalf. Do you see the mocking trinity that has been set up? Satan gives power to the beast that is his image and then gives power to the second beast, which points everybody back to the f- Satan and the first beast. I right, think about the triune God. Father is in heaven. Son is the image of the Father in heaven. The Son ascends back to heaven. The Holy Spirit comes. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Hey, look at Christ. Look at the Father. Look here, look here. Right? Satan is blatantly mocking God, trying to overthrow him. The second beast, then at the end of uh, chat, or verse 12, says, the, the beast made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on the behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. And even with the language made the people worship, right, there's not yet, it's quickly coming, but there's not yet a physical force to worshiping the first beast. It's not, a to- it's not a battle of the wills, like a toddler being told to put on their shoes and saying no. Right? There, there is a convincing because of words and actions that this beast is worth worshiping, that the world that we live in is worth worshiping. It's deception. It's showing off its impressive knowledge and wordsmithing, and instead of being physically forced to worship They're convinced to worship, and so they do. They're so convinced that what this beast is doing is so good and so right that there's little to no negative thought about setting up an image to honor the beast. After the image is put in place, look at what the deceptive false trinity does. Verse 15, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Now we're seeing some force. I don't know about you, but if I'm walking down the street and a statue starts talking and making sense, it's going to get my attention. Right? We, don't, we don't know how the beast act, or the, the, the image actually starts to speak. Maybe it's the second beast speaking through the statue. Maybe it's, it's some sort of dark magic but it speaks and people are impressed and they listen to it. And they're so bought into it that everybody, except the Christians, agree that worshiping this is the right thing to do. So much so that it becomes a capital offense to not worship the beast or the image of the beast. Right? This is not a, a new thing. Right? The, say, nothing original. Satan does nothing original. Right? The Emperor Trajan did the same thing in Rome. And you're not worshiping me, you're dead. There's physical, cons- or the, there are, there's physical force and literal consequences now. Right? Before, there was deception that we had to watch out for, but now the consequences are you either bow and worship of the thing that I'm telling you to worship or you die. 
This image continues to, to create and pass down mandates. Verse 16, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their forehead so that they could not buy or sell unless they had a mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This mark is of the first beast, the Antichrist. The opposites listed out in verse 16, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, get at the totality of this movement. You're not going to escape it. Every single person, whether you are uh, the poorest of poor living on a dirt floor in India, or you're buying the $800,000 mansion, I don't remember, $80 million, that's what it was, uh, mansion that just listed, right? Um, you're not escaping this reality. If you want to go about your regular daily life, you need this. And yet this mark is the opposite of the sealing of God. Right? It is Satan, again, mimicking, mocking, and copying God. God seals his people back in chapter 7. Now Satan seals his people. Now whether this seal is literal or figurative... The point that John is making is that God knows whose are his and whose are Satan's. And Satan knows whose are his and whose are God's. This is why John says in verse 18, as we deal with this uh, sealing of the people, this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. That number is 666. Now, for sure, this verse has sparked paranoia over the years about everything from credit cards and cell phones to microchips and vaccines. Right, like, you make it up, it's there. Right, uh, John would have understood to a certain extent the number to represent the numerical values of ancient letters. Right? And so he would have assigned a name based on the letter values. Uh, move forward in history, Nero fits this pretty perfectly. Um, Nero might have been an antichrist, but he's not the antichrist. The Bible talks about a lot of antichrists prior to the antichrist. Uh, the numerical value coming out of the letters is important, but I think in the symbolic symbolic nature of revelation, we need to pay attention to the reality that God's number is 777. And 777 were, uh, represents a perfect number symbolizing God's infinite perfection, majesty, holiness, goodness, his just mercy. And if that's the case, then number 666 stands for all that is detestable, wicked, and evil. What is key here and will push us into application is John's call for wisdom, to think deeply, to look beyond the scope of just our lives, past even the shores of our nation, to understand what is unfolding and how it's to unfold. If, if our understanding of the mark and the events of the beasts themselves are all tied up just in America, I would argue that our views are too far uh, or too narrow-sighted to keep articulating them. God has a grander plan than just the U.S. And don't get me wrong, I'm patriotic, I love America, it is a great place to live. But when our focus is so minute, we miss the global working of God. Right? When, when we decry how our country is falling down and left, there are other countries rising up around the world. America used to send missionaries, thousands of missionaries into Africa, and now Africa is hosting missionary and theology conferences and sending missionaries into Europe and into the Americas. Right? The global perspective changes how we understand what is happening. The global perspective changes our hope, right? We should not give up hope. We must have wisdom. We must think deeply. We must be aware. This is what John is getting at in this passage. So John has this vision roughly 1,929 years ago. 
We've read, what, we've read the text. We've talked about loosely what it means. But how does this apply to us? How do we deal with things like a seal or a required thing on our heads or our hands? What does that look like? What, what do we do with this information? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand that a lot of this gets at how we're living. If you put something on your forehead or on your right hand, right, the, the Israelites were called to put the law of God on their right hand and on their foreheads. Right, these are things that you present, that, that this, this is what people know you for. Right, so in one sense, these seals and these numbers get at how are you living? What are you living for? What do you value? What do people know to be true about what you truly believe? All right, let me give you two thoughts and then uh, we'll close with one point of application. First thought, these things are not new. All right, consider the Israelites in the Old Testament. They're lied to, they're led astray, they're captured and killed because they give in to the desires of their flesh, the allures of the cultures around them, and things get bad for them. Right? Consider even the plight of the disciples in Jesus. Think of the church of Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2. The church faced false teaching deception, persecution, they were being killed. Jesus even acknowledges the reality that they are living in a town with Satan. And then he has the audacity to rebuke them for tolerating false teaching. Remember, Satan's role with the beasts are not specifically to have the world worship them. They're already doing that. The beasts come to deceive the church. We must be aware of the deception. We must not tolerate false teaching. False teaching is different than difference of opinion. False teaching is teaching that goes contrary to the word of God, that, that talks about uh, a savior that is not Jesus or a sin problem that is not biblical. Right? Our sin problem is not needing to be saved from the world. Our sin problem is needing to be saved from ourselves. This is not new, and because it's not new, when these things happen, whether that's here or in our lives elsewhere or we see it unfolding around the world, we should not be surprised. In fact, I would argue we should be preparing ourselves and our families for the reality that this world is not our home, that we are citizens of another kingdom, and the false trinity that we saw today is seeking to rule this world, and he hates us. Not like, oh, we tolerate each other. No, Satan hates you because you are God's image bearer seeking to make God known. Satan does not want that. So when hardships and persecution arise, we should not be surprised. This is part of why we need to move beyond just the shores of our own country to understand these things. Because even John points out that every tribe and every nation and every tongue We'll deal with this. God is on his throne over the entire world, not just our world. All right, so these things are not new. Second, we should expect and prepare for a life in which the world will not be our friend. Satan and his beasts, his minions will gain power and God's people will lose favor and influence in this world. Governments will grow more and more hostile towards Christians and biblical values. It's promised. It's stated. But this does not mean we give up hope. It does not mean we disengage from politics. Instead, I would argue we're, in our awareness, we should be active. We should think about who we vote for and, and choose people who protect freedom because I don't know about you, but when we get into passages like this, it's like, I want to be with Jesus, but I don't want this. Like, I don't want to deal with the craziness of family vacation being interrupted by a dragon and a beast out of the sea. Right? Like, this is not a appealing. Being with Jesus is appealing. Right? But even in the political side of the conversation, 
we, part of standing guard and, and being aware of what's to come is not letting politicians be the source of our hope or our spiritual well-being. I'm going to say something crazy. No politician can be trusted, not one. I've yet to see one in my lifetime that has actually done what they promised to do. And yet we put our hope in them. Everything will be fine if this person gets into office. Maybe, maybe not. More than that, though, it means we need to be on guard against false teaching. Because Satan is not aiming to, to fool the world. He's already done that. He's aiming to fool us, to distract us. Being on guard then doesn't mean pointing at our adversaries or the, the people who oppose us and calling them antichrist. It means seeking Jesus. Consider the, the virgins that Jesus talks about in his parable of Matthew 25, waiting for the bridegroom. They're awoken at night. They get up, they get ready. Some of them take their lamps with extra oil and they go out to wait for the bridegroom. Others, in their excitement, just run out unprepared. And as the moment arises, they realize that they're unprepared. And so they go back to, be, to try to be prepared and they miss it. They're caught off guard. They have been essentially deceived. So how do we come into this or leave this actually being prepared, actually knowing Jesus? I would say we need to abide, like live with Jesus, be in his word, know what is true. Right? It would be foolish to try to study and know every potential deception to be ever thrown. It's impossible. You will probably actually be, de be deceived in your studying of it. But what, you, what we can do is know what is true, what is right, what is good. It's all right here. Be students of God's word. Be in community that points us back to God's word and to God himself. If we know the truth, we will be able to identify the false deceptions. If we don't know the truth, the false deceptions will take us. All right, finally, the practical application side. I, I think at the end of the day, if we hold that these things will happen, however it is that they unfold, we need to assess what we're living for. This is where the call to be wise and have patient endurance and faith comes in. Where do we draw the line of our faith and living in this world? It's tough. There's not a cookie cutter answer to this question. And I have friends who have quit jobs and become unemployed because of convictions against signing a DEI contract. I have other friends convinced that they need to apply or, or keep a job and sign the contract so that they can provide for their families. Right? There is a tension to living out your faith in which we come back to, what's the word of God say? What's the spirit doing in your heart as far as your convictions go? But being aware of the ease in which lies creep in. Right? The, the lie that love is love is a very easy thing to creep into a church because this should be the most loving place on earth. Are we aware of the lies that culture is trying to teach us? Are we willing to have the hard conversations when our kids' favorite TV show goes woke and they can't watch it anymore? Are we willing to tell a boss no when they're asking us to do something or sign something that flies in the face of scripture? and insults the image of God? Are we willing to step up and say, we choose Jesus, we choose what is better, or will we continue putting things in front of Jesus? What are we living for? Because here's the reality. If we're not willing to live for something, it is incredibly unlikely that we'd be willing to die for something. And yet the Christian faith is, come to me, lay down yourself, pick up your cross. It is not about you, it's about Jesus. Right? We think about that spiritually, but, but Revelation forces the reality of like, are we raising kids who are resilient enough? Are we parents who are resilient enough to say, I choose Jesus, I choose death? It's so incredibly countercultural, especially if that culture is saying, hey, life, easy life, come here. 
We have to wrestle with these things. The moment, the, the th- time to decide who you are and what you believe and what you're going to stand for is not in the moment that you have to stand for it. It's now. It's seeking the Lord now so that if this day arises in your lifetime, you are ready. It's seeking the Lord now so that if this day arises in your children's or your grandchildren's lifetime, they are ready. So that we can stand before our God and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. See, if we live in in light of the warnings of this passage, that Satan and his beast with his deceptions and lies are going to gain power and traction, then we must seek Jesus. Like, it's the most important thing in the world. We must worship God trusting that he is actually on his throne over all things in all the world. And it is in that space of seeking Jesus and worshiping God in community that we will find a faith that is not moved by the tides of culture or emotion or fleshly desires. We'll live a faith, we'll live a life because of a faith in a God who's at work in this world that changes the lives of those around us and changes the lives of those around them and so on and so forth. Ultimately, a life lived for God, being steadfast to see the deceptions and the attacks of the evil one, will lead us to a place where we get to stand before God and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, as we lay down our crowns and say, no, God, it's all about you. It's always been you, your glory, your kingdom, your work. May it all be about him. May it be so. Let's pray. God, thank you for the truths of your word. God, I pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds as we leave this place. God, would you give us eyes to see and know the truths of your word and to cling to them and to you tightly. Would we not be deceived by false teachers and the lies of the evil one, but would we trust in who you are and who you say we are? God, would you be honored and glorified in the lives that we live? Would we be ready for a day in which we give an account or have to stand up and say, I choose Jesus. Help us to love you more than anything in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again.